you don't have enough ability to explain what it is you're doing and inspire people to want to go on that journey with you, it's going to be incredibly hard for you to be successful. It's good to see at least a few faces out there, people that I already know well or have met at least a couple of times. I, I put this up here because this is what I do. I'm an angel investor and I serve on boards. I actually, in, in preparation for this, I sat down and counted and I have made more than 40 angel investments. Thank you. <laughs> that does include the investments through Triangle Angel Partners, but not the investments through the Tweener Fund, where I'm also an investor. And I think that he's probably already made 40 investments right. there. Right. So, um, and then I've, I counted up also, I've been on 13 boards. Right now, on boards of directors, right now I'm on two. One is a, an advanced hospital bassinet company called Couplet Care. And the other is a digital advertising agency that's virtual, where the CEOs actually were in Colorado, but they moved to California. So, never met them in person, only Zoom. Um, Jim alluded to, to one more thing about the angel investing world. So I, I spent uh, several years in, uh, in leadership with Triangle Angel Partners and helped raise Triangle Partners Fund 2. We finished making initial investments out of Fund 2, and several of us, including Merle Mason over there, um, have come together with people from RTP Capital, which is an angel network that started around the same time as Triangle Angel Partners, that 19, uh, excuse me, 2011, 2012 era. Um, they had a network, but they wanted to raise a fund. So uh, Elaine Bowley, Mark Friedman, and Mary Musakia from RTP Capital have come together with us, and we're raising a new angel fund. We're having our first close this month on $3 million. Our target is five. We won't go over six. We're also extremely lucky because we recruited John Cambier, who's been a partner at Idea Fund Partners, to come join us as our fund manager. This is going to be a, a member-run group like Triangle Angel Partners has been, but it's going to be great to have John to keep the trains running. So I, the other, that's the other reason I put this information up here. If you are a startup with high growth potential, we are going to be screening companies and we'll be making investments soon. Screening now, we'll be making investments soon. Um, so as, as, uh, as Jim um, suggested, I um, basically can't keep a job. <laughs> I have a very low board threshold. So since I, I got an MBA at UNC, I've been a strategy consultant. I've been uh, employee number 10 at a venture back startup, co-founder of another venture back startup. The first one was a success. So the CEO and I were able to go raise money for uh, adventure number two. Um, we ran that for five years in crashed and burned, so I have my own terrible story as well. Um, I went on from that to consult with former clients and then consult, do marketing consulting in Warsaw, Poland for a couple of years. That was a, I could tell lots of stories about that too. Um, I was an executive vice president and business unit president at TransUnion. I joined there thinking it would be easier to find a, a um, an entrepreneurial gig as a general manager at TransUnion than as a part-time marketing consultant in Poland. <laughs> but it ended up being a, a, a lot of fun and a, a very interesting eight years. Then I was the, the uh, CEO and president of, of Chopper Track. The company does pedestrian traffic counting using overhead digital video. Now, keep in mind, I was an English lit major. And now I was running a company that had vision engineers and designed uh, overhead counting devices that we then managed. So it's quite a progression deeper and deeper into technology through my career. While I was there, I joined my first board. The company's called Showing Time, Showing Management Services for Residential Real Estate. I was ended up being on that board for 14 years, and that was probably the most fun I had as a board member. We went from single-digit millions to being acquired by Zillow in the fall of, of uh, 21 for half a billion dollars. So it was a pretty exciting run. And I gotta say that the success of 
my angel investments, the time and money into that company, um, have paid back for all of the other mistakes that I've made. Because angel investments is a game of, of uh, diversification, and you really do need to make sure that you're you're not just trying to, to uh, what, put it all on red. Right. That the rule of thumb is you try to do more than 20. All right, so Jim asked me to talk about what do angel investors look for. So I think probably if you have hung around this group or hung around people in the triangle, this is what you've heard. We're looking for a, an interesting market, a great team, and a novel solution. Now what do I mean by an interesting market? I mean something that is either nascent but fast growing and it's obvious like AI, it's going to be transformational. It could be a giant but slow growing market where the, the leaders have not kept up. Um, you think about uh, automotive. The leaders are companies that have been, been around for 100 years plus and that, yeah, look what Tesla has done with something that's new and innovative. So, interesting market. Great team. It's wonderful to have an intelligent, dynamic, um, inventive CEO. But solo premiers are rarely completely successful. They really need to build a team. And the third, by, by novel solutions. I'm sorry, if I see one more pitch for a social network, I, I'm liable to. Um, I don't know. Them out of the room. Yeah. I'll say, I'll say that's very interesting, but I am not your target market. Uh, so when you talk to investors like me and like Merle, I, one of the things I often hear is, do you think this is a good idea? And a lot of times, I have no idea if it's a good idea. Like Ty was saying, I, 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 if I'm not your target market, I can't tell you whether or not you've got a good product market fit. Um, when I think about the hospital bassinet company, I kind of have an idea that that's what they're trying to do is, 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 a, is a novel solution. They've done a bunch of research. I have two sons. I know what their, what my experience was, but it's been a long time. Um, so, and what's really the market for them, the, if the mom, but I gotta say the moms are important, but what's really important is what can these bassinets do for the hospitals? Can they save nurse time? Can they reduce risk of something like an infant fall that could cost the hospital a lot? So in that case, even though I'm a mom, I'm not necessarily the target market. It's the payors, it's the people who are gonna buy the thing. So when you're thinking about a novel solution, you gotta think about how does this fit into the market? You've got you, in this case, you've got users who are the moms and you've got payers who are the hospitals. So, any questions or comments or thoughts about this before I go on with what I think are kind of three overlooked? Yeah, Merle. How do you rank order those Oh, great question. How do you rank order those things? I, I personally think team is the most important. Um, I've been sitting in on a second year MBA class over at UNC. Um, and it is for students who are interning with venture funds and angel groups of funds. And that has been a question that the professors have asked the students come, to come back with. And it's really interesting how those things rank differently from different investors. And some people are really interested in um, crazy new science, things that are transformational. One of the companies where I'm on the advisory board has a nano mosaic filter for getting lithium out of groundwater and drilling wastewater. Now that is a novel solution. But for me, it's team first. Yeah? Jan Parker will say, hey, Parker. Thanks, thanks for your willingness. What's your advice for solopreneurs that are recruiting a co founder? But that's so important. What success have you seen in finding a partner and what's the point how to do that? I get that question a lot. How do you find a co-founder? So the, the best way to do it is to come to things like this and talk with people. You often can find someone who um, 
Now let's see, like Steve, who's kind of casting around trying to figure out what's his next new thing. He's had a success. And he's raised his hand and said, well, I'm kind of interested in looking around and finding something new. Um, there's a podcast that's probably four or five years old now. It's from Gimlet Media called Startup. I think it's the second episode. In that, you have to go back to the very beginning. You can still find it. And it's about how the founder found his co-founder. And it was somebody he, he ran into, into at an event. The guy was a strategy consultant. They got to talking. The consultant started working with him nights and weekends. And then they had to figure out how to divide an imaginary pie. So how do you share equity and attract someone like that? I, I don't think there's any special secret. It really is getting out and talking to people. Did you say Gimlet Media? Gimlet Media. It was acquired by Spotify a number of years ago. Okay. Um, and it's called Startup. They only have eight minutes, so you probably move on. So <laughs> these are things. You may not hear, and, but these are things. These are things that we talk about when you're when you're not necessarily in the room. As a founder, are you coachable? Are you a learning CEO? And by that I mean, it's not that we expect you to or want you to do everything that we suggest, but we want to know that you're hearing suggestions and going back and. And thinking about it, trying to prove it's wrong, trying to prove it's right, and coming back and telling us what, what you've learned. The whole learning mindset, um, there are two quick examples of that. There's a guy in the trial named Zach Clayton. I don't know if any of you know him. He's kind of under, he's an extremely successful entrepreneur. He started out with a digital agency, and now he has, he runs a whole bunch of the mattress review websites and makes money basically by selling people mattresses. Very successful. Um, and he, he really is a great example of being a learning CEO. He started his first business when he was 24. And he read books. He recruited me and some other um, incredibly successful uh, people to come be on his advisory board. He went to Bell Leadership over at Chapel Hill. He uh, challenged his executive team to read books, and they would basically do book group. And I, it has, I, I know it's really been great for him to be that kind of a learning CEO and really invest in his own education and also the education of his team. The ability to recruit, re re recruit and retain. Um, this goes back to the, the question about how to find a co-founder, how to fill out a senior team. If you don't have enough ability to explain what it is you're doing and inspire people to want to go on that journey with you, it's going to be incredibly hard for you to be successful. Because you're going to need that ability to attract investors, not just us, but the next round and the next round. You're going to need that ability in order to attract customers. So if you don't have the uh, ability to inspire and attract, that's that's a problem. And then third, the, the whole idea about thinking about exits. You don't have to tell us that you're going to sell this thing in five years. In fact, that would be scary. But to come to us with, here's some comparables. Here's what other companies like us have been acquired for. Um, here are people that are like to, likely to be our acquirers. I know at Showing Time for the last probably three years I was on the board, we talked a lot about who the likely acquirers were. And we identified Zillow as the most likely, the best strategic acquirer. And when the time came, we had um, offers from three strategics and one, um, one private equity firm. And all three of the strategics are ones that we had identified, but we had been thinking about that for some time. That was an old, that was an old startup at that point. But, uh, but, but that conversation, we had that conversation. And as investors, we want to know that you aren't planning to turn this into what we refer to as a lifestyle business. So you're not planning to build something that you're going to pass down to your children. 
Any questions before I move on to some thoughts about boards? Well, I'm going to come back again with my email address, so if you want to talk later. Uh, what about boards? There'll be Q&A after the panel as well. Okay. So, um, why do I need a board? Well, if you're taking money, the, the investors are probably going to require it. It's pretty unusual that they don't. Um, oversight. Frankly, as a CEO, somebody who had a board, it is really good to have people who are more experienced than you are who are asking you the hard questions. If you're paying people, you know, your subordinates, you're paying your talent, you're paying your training, they may not ask you as, as challenging a question as Merle would, but not anybody else, have, not many other people would. Um, so it's really good to have people who are experienced who can really poke you and ask you and challenge you about whether or not you're doing the right thing. Now, if it's a board of directors, they can't fire you. So that, that is a thing that it has happened. Um, in the best case, it's, a, it's an adjoint agreement. The CEO says, I've been great at getting it from zero to five, but I'm not the right person to take it from five to 40. And we've had companies in our portfolio who have, who have come to us and said, I'm not the right guy. In some cases, there's, there's somebody who's already on the board who's the right person to take it to the next level. Uh, in some cases, the, um, the CEO collaborates with the board to go out and find the right person. It's sad if it's if the CEO can't recognize that they aren't scaling the same way the business needs to scale. Uh, that's what I've alluded to strategic advice. Um, so who, sh who should you have on your board? Obviously, the CEO should be on the board. Obviously, if you have investors, they are going to want to be on your board or be represented on your board. And then you should definitely try to have people on your board who know your industry and can help you. Introductions, technology challenges. With the Bassinet Company, we could really have used somebody who knew a lot more about med device contract manufacturing and contract um, design for manufacturing. Um, no one that you pay. If you were paying someone, you were already paying them for their expertise. You don't want your co-founder, you love them, you know they're going to feel bad not to be on the board, let them be a board observer, but um, don't waste that precious board seat. I think I skipped the... Oh, just quick, board of directors is a fiduciary responsibility. They take legal risk, so the people aren't going to want to serve on your board of directors unless you have directors and officers liability insurance. These are the guys that could fire you. Uh, board of advisors, that is literally people that you have recruited to advise you. Usually, you will want to have their interests be aligned with yours, and you want to make sure that they stay interested, so you give them some stock options or some restricted stock. And then finally, a scientific advisory board. With the SNN company, we have recruited well known academics in the field of, of neonatal and mother-baby bonding to be on the scientific board. And they're basically, um, they provide advice, um, introductions, and credibility. If you're in the scientific field, that who's on your scientific board is really important. All right. Before I Go back up with the email address one more time. Any questions? Any more questions? I think you'll get another. Yes. There's a question. Two if questions. You the, uh, if you repeat the insurance board of advisors and something insurance. Okay. Uh, for people who are going to be on your board of directors, they are going to want to make sure that you have directors and officers liability insurance, often referred to as DNO insurance, and that means that if someone sues the company and tries to sue the individuals who are on the board and frankly the management you as the ceo could be sued individually um, so the dno insurance the directors and officers insurance is insurance against that i've never seen it happen thank god with any of my companies but 
I, I required it as a bomb someone's board of directors. There was another one back there. Merrill. Oh, Merrill. How are all those people who are in the I'm sorry? How are these people? How do you pay, how do you pay those people? So, um, look, my experience is it starts with stock options or restricted stock. Usually stock options. Um, I know when I get stock options, I ask for, usually for employees, stock options will expire 90 days after they're no longer employed. As an advisor, I ask for a much longer expiration period because I figure I'm providing advice early. I may be supplanted by someone in the future, but if I've done a good job, I've changed the trajectory of the company, and I want to have an option to benefit from that you know, five years or 10 years down the road. Um, as with the trolling time, as the company got bigger, that turned, this, the stock options that I got for the first six years turned into um, not a lot of cash, but some cash and some restricted stock. With um, the scientific advisors, usually it's a small honorarium, a small honorarium, you know, thousand dollars a year or something like that they do not value stock options typically um, and for advisors usually it is stock options 